Hello and welcome to The Appetite, a podcast from the founders of Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment program in Seattle, Washington. I'm your host, Carter Umhow, a therapist, artist, and writer, and I'm joined by the Opal founders, Dr. Lexi Giblin, Kara Bazzi, Julie Church. Today, we're talking about the ever-complicated topic of what and how to eat. There is an unbelievable amount of information out there, both overt and more subtle, on how we should be thinking about the food we put into our bodies. Today, Julie Church, co-founder and nutrition director at Opal, leads us in this conversation inspired by the work of Ellen Satter and challenges the assumption that there is any one way to eat well. We discuss the underlying assumptions and messages of popular fad diets like the Whole30, clean eating, and other detox-like diets. We'll also get into some more specifics on how to think about the actual how of eating, rather than just the what, by leaning into the question of how to parent yourself well in creating both structure and freedom in your relationship to food. Okay, so uh, today we're talking about what's gone wrong in our culture's relationship to food that we're so inundated with so many different conflicting messages about the right way to eat. Uh, Julie, do you have some sense of when all this complication started? I One of the things that I always think about when it comes to this is what was it, what is it supposed to be? Like kind of getting back to the natural. And I think something that is a desire is just like, oh, that it should be easy and natural and yeah, what kind of got in the way of that? And so I, I do think back to where did we learn, not me necessarily, but <laughs> generations before me, mm-hmm. uh, learn to eat and how did they learn to eat? And I think of a home and I think of their own dinner table. I think of maybe some land outside that perhaps somebody farmed to some level. I'm not saying like full farm, but even the green beans or the, mm-hmm. I don't know, small things that they might bring in. And I I. I do think it just comes from culture and identity and family and things that were passed down so much. And then you kind of come to the 1930s, at least in America, and that's when the diet culture started. So that's actually not that long ago, the 1930s, if you think about it. And so prior to that, it was less dictated from the outside, and it was more of a personal thing as to how one ate and how people interacted with food. So then in the 30s, then the dieting industry started. And I think you could kind of speak to that, I suppose. But just so many very interesting advertisements. Uh, I wish we could show images on this, right? But remember, I mean, just weird. Weird, weird images. What sorts of, of things? Well, I know recently I saw one and it was all about tomato juice as like the answer <laughs> to both health and appearance. And it had like this definitely shaped body, you know, female shaped formed body. And then it had next to it was like the tomato juice can made into this hourglass shape. And I'm like, this is wow. so interesting. Yeah. Mm. So I, if you do a search of like early diet ads, they're very fascinating. Inter- Actually, here's the image right here. You can see it, Carter. I have it in front of me. <laughs> what was happening culturally, do you think, that brought that to the for the dieting industry in? I'm not the historian. So Maybe. Okay. I'm not that good with that. But it. I mean, at that time, it is equal with, I mean, in terms of food, it was the um, industrial revolution and a lot of the depending more on industry and less on the person in terms of food industry. So that's one of the things that was more mass produced tomato juice specifically mm-hmm. to thinking about tomato juice. But um, this thing that was found to really help with um, nutritional deficiencies in hospitals and that could be given as a high vitamin C food. And then it became this sort of quote unquote superfood of the time. But then it was sort of hijacked by the diet industry to say this is also a low calorie food that can be drank and filling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so but there was um, the parallel of like a lot of industry change and role changes, right, of like trying to figure out what how are people going to kind of move forward in what industry and who's going to be the power at the time and who's going to... It makes me wonder if it was a time when food was just becoming more marketable. Like mm-hmm. there was something yeah, about the... the economical. They were, yes. yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. there was like sort of a salesman yeah. attitude around yeah. food for the first time. First time because of... it's being packaged, mass right. produced with labels and with... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So you better buy our food and hear yeah. the reasons and yeah. this is why it fits within the... Yeah. The food pyramid, yeah. which is, again, also yeah. commercial. Yeah. All of it, yeah. The prohibition also with alcohol mm-hmm. use and the, the drink of tomato juice combined with, <laughs> what, what's the Bloody Mary? Vodka, I don't even know. Typically, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Gin. But that was one of the places, too. It was actually around the same time as this diet containing t- tomato juice is being promoted was also similar to that. 
So I think that that started that trend of people looking outside of maybe their own home or their own bodies to say, okay, what do I eat? How do I eat? And then even into what I think of as um, more maybe more current era of the 80s and 90s, then there was a woman who is actually still uh, known in sociology and in nutrition and politics, actually, too. Marion Nestle came out with kind of her little phrase of how to eat. And her phrase was eat less, move more, eat lots of fruits and vegetables. Take that in kind of just I think the eat less is interesting to think about in the present. Um, but that was the 80s and 90s. And then and then the 2000s, Michael Pollan came out with his seven words and all of the books that ensue. I mean, Marion Nestle is also a prolific writer and researcher. And mm-hmm. so similar, um, lots of things that you can find on both of these folks. But then Michael Pollan's seven words are eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I think both of those kind of spanning some of those decades and then into the present era, we have a similar, I think there's a similar rhetoric out there of like eat less and these particular foods, like eats lots of fruits and vegetables. So I feel like those have set us up to feel like what we're supposed to eat is the main focus of your relationship with food, the what. And easily these two can parallel to me is a lot of the current diets that are pretty common out there right now is a lot of reliance on Mm plant-based foods and then curbing the amount that you eat based on this. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm based on what, I mean, it's just eating less in relation to something or not too much in relation to something. To me, it feels external, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's, in my mind, the amount of food we eat is very personalized. And so to read not too much or eat less is concerning to me. Mm -hmm. It feels like that's easily misused. So can you go back to kind of explaining a little bit more about kind of your imagination of Mm. what it looked like before there was an external voice telling us what Mm. to eat? Because we've talked about body wisdom so much, of course, on this podcast, but in terms of the details of yeah. being in relationship to your plate in yeah. some way, or maybe not even overthinking it that much, what is, what would that have looked like? Well, I, I mean, I, I, in terms of imagining that and having some sort of picture, I mean, <laughs> I just, I, I envision that there's food available, right? There has to be plenty and abundance of food of a variety and familiarity people eat and it's not as much of a content of the conversation as to like how much somebody's eating or what somebody's eating but there's food available and people are participating in feeding their body and then they move on to the next event I see it as still a part of social entities you know social events and Mm -hmm. um, something that draws people together for community it also you know back hunter gatherer like it's the whole purpose of life like you do this you go and get food and then you eat it you know you store it and you keep it so it's really so much of life and system I, I wouldn't be a female business owner if there wasn't the movement in society to have more industrial revolution and have there be processing of food, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm having to actually cut down the wheat and then make it into bread, I'm doing that. I'm not opening a business. (laughs) Um, So anyway, I don't know, that's a little offshoot, but I think that that's a big change. But I think connection to it in some way or another, I suppose, there's the big focus on it all consuming at that point, right? Mm Hunting and gathering and like having it be all that you are. But then also in that when I think of maybe more just a few generations before, I just think of it being fairly simple, a little less less options. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was thinking about like you eat what's available. So mm-hmm. there's such a focus yeah. on just yeah. nourishment. And there is a that. drive for it, right? So there would be appetite that's the drive. And I think that's something that I think we've lost touch with, um, lost trust in too, is just that that natural drive for the need for food and the connection and the acceptance that that's okay, that yes, I am hungry, I need food, therefore I'm going to go get it, or I'm going to eat what's in front of me or what's served to me. Mm -hmm. And now I think it's just more complicated. People feel like there's all these different rules and different plans that they've been told or different mandates around different foods that then it doesn't feel as neutral to just come to a buffet of food and decide to eat uh, based on one's appetite. So obviously within our world, with our focus on eating disorders, mm-hmm. we see this on an extreme, the impact of not having that kind of internal sense or that more natural relationship with food. Can you speak to the some of the specifics of how, how this plays out in mm-hmm. a way that winds up pretty unhealthy? 
I, I think it starts really, honestly, I think it starts young um, in that way for many people. Even though there's a natural instinct to listen to one's appetite, it can get interrupted pretty quickly if there is a caregiver that's involved that then is going to be more controlling around um, what foods are being available or, or received and then how much. And so, yeah, so what does that amount to? I mean, it amounts to having sort of emotional and relational connections to food that feel that kind of can fuel a cycle that can end up being disordered if it's hiding and hoarding food or eating in a particular manner in public versus the way that one might eat beyond that. And I think one of the, oh, I don't know, a pattern that I think I, I my kind of heart go, like I connect to with more compassion, I suppose, is just the the idea the belief like people get to a point of saying, I am, I overeat. I eat too much, like a statement like that. And it it has stemmed from more of a consistent lack, of, like deprivation ment mentality around them. So they don't have access to the foods that might be satisfying to them or enough food. And they've been told to eat a certain type of food or a certain amount of food. And so then they believe because when they actually have free access to food, they eat in a more uncontrolled way, that they are somebody that eats too much. Mm. Um, and I, that's, that's a consistent pattern that I feel like I, I see and I, I react to, right, the Nesli and the Pollen quotes mm. in that way because I do think that those are misused yeah. and, and trickle down to the way that most people think we should be eating. And I don't, I don't know how much freedom we're given to truly listen to appetite and listen and eat enough food. Mm -hmm. You've talked before about the psychological impact of knowing that there are foods that exist now, whether or not they would have 30 years ago or, you know, it's not the original way that people eat. Like yeah. it, the psycho psychological impact of knowing that like Oreos are available to you mm -hmm. and you can have those mm -hmm. just deciding that, well, that's not the natural way people ate before there were Oreos. So I'm not going to have them isn't really relevant anymore mm -hmm. because once you're aware that there's actually food in front of you that you're not able to have, mm -hmm. there is a little bit of a deprivation mentality. Yeah. yeah. And I think with the, or I feel like Oreos, I've thought of Rice Krispie treats or something that mm. I think about in my story. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's, if they, if somebody has developed positive connections or negative connections, but just, you know, experiences with Oreos or Rice Krispie treats, then here they are. And now they are a part of one story. And if right. you can come to a decision of, ethics or politics around the ingredients in some of those foods or the production or a company or whatever. But regardless, if they're a part of your story with food and you've decided, no, I'm never going to eat them again, I just I just don't think that that leads to a holistic, balanced way of eating because then where is the ability to have sort of the context of where you are and go, oh, that's right. I want those Oreos because they <laughs> remind me of my childhood play, you know, dessert and like tea with with my dolls and my girlfriend, you know, like that's what you do. <laughs> that's, well, somewhere, it, yeah. What you what you eat getting connected to weight being such a big mm. part of the decision making because I would imagine that was not my great grandma Tilly. I do not think she was eating while thinking about what it would mean to her body shape and size. And mm -hmm. I know, and that's where I do believe a lot of that the dieting started making that link. So the more media and that industry, the diet industry really started to make that link. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, there's possibly other factors that are more sociopolitical that like I'm less connected to. But I just think when there's this image of a particular and, you know, with what they get from it and all that stuff associated with this particular body size, it's mm -hmm. it starts to make a message. It gives a message that, oh, this is this is the life you want mm -hmm. or something. And what seems to be minimized now is the psychological contribution to what we're, we're what happens with eating and the emotional side those get undervalued in the f food making decisions of like the impact of restriction mm -hmm. yeah and i think when you know why do people choose to do the modern diets i guess it's, what are some of the reasons that you've heard that people would choose to do i mean what are some of the modern diets if we're going to name them whole 30 is the one that comes Whole30, to my mind yeah. first mm -hmm. paleo paleo weight watchers keto like mm -hmm. a ketogenic diet what jenny else? craig <laughs> dating yourself you're dating yourself <laughs> the cabbage diet okay wow sure group right fruit diet cleansing yeah detoxing, detoxing in cleansing. general is is i think yeah something that most people seem to be on board with mm -hmm. these days 
everyone needs yeah. to like kind of eat clean so that get all the all toxins, those toxins out of their have body to go. as a common totally right yeah. yes. yes Julie yeah, I'd love to hear you speak about yeah. the whole 30 toxins. since that's such a big I know part of our culture right sure. now sure I know we feel it at least right now in the northwest I'm not sure if it's everywhere right now but one of the things we're listing all these diets the things that I think about is okay well what what's the What's the difference between some of them? And I would say we throw in sort of the weight motivation, like people that are looking to a diet to change their body shape, size, weight, like that. And I would say that a lot of people that are doing that are looking at a calorie restrictive diet. So I would say that's more the Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers thing. And then we have people that are searching for healing or cleansing or... The detox thing. Uh, Medical improvements. Yeah, yeah, health improvements. And those diets, I feel, are more in that category of it may not actually lead to people eating less calories. Like, that's not the focus. They're not counting calories or counting that kind of stuff. They're more so changing the content of what they're eating. But when I, when I think of the the emphasis on the detox and the cleansing or even I, – I put Whole30 in more of that detox cleanse kind of world because usually – People are, they're not thinking about eating less food from that. They more so are changing the content of what they're putting in their body and saying, you know, restricting themselves from, I think it's six different things or something. But in that, they are, I think, having more of a cleansing, detoxing kind of mentality. Restart. A a restart. restart. Oh, their body. Okay. Yeah. A restart. Yeah. And one of the details that I think gets missed in some of the conversation around why that's so like normal and natural to do this is that we do have organs, the liver and the kidney that are detoxifying organs. And that's like the main primary role that they have in our body. And they, they work, they can do a lot of the work (laughs) for Mm. us. And why our bodies, I've heard somebody a long time ago say this, like our bodies are not dirty. Our bodies are not wrong. They don't need that kind of cleansing consistently in that way. Like we can allow for our organs to do it. And I react to that, the detox cleanse mentality and think that we need to do that, take that into our own hands instead of trusting a part, parts of our bodies that are actually designed to do that. So I think that is one of the pieces that with the Whole30 that I, I feel concern around. And I think, yeah, the psychological impact, but I think maybe for me to just speak to more of the biological impact, you know, the the foods that are eliminated with the Whole30 are the no sugar no alcohol, no dairy, no legumes, no grains. <laughs> and so those are the, all the categories that are then not eaten. And that's a lot of food. Grains alone. Whoa. I mean, no okay. grains. Whoa. <laughs> uh, so, and that's so, and I think no, that something it. like Whole30 gets a pop culture sort of stamp of approval and it makes it seem like dieting is benign. I think like it doesn't even mm-hmm. get, I don't, a lot of people don't even think of it as a diet because it feels like, oh, this is really benign. But when you make a huge change in eliminating not having all of those things, you are going to adjust your digestive tract and there's going to be changes within your hormonal production. And there's just a lot of things that happen. And people are looking usually, like I'm saying, to these things to have something happen, like maybe to have a feeling or have a change or have a adjustment to something that they are wanting to have changed, like if it's healing or and I think the concern I have is that, okay, so may, maybe they're going to start to identify that something happened within these 30 days by making the change with the nutrition that they did in some of those things that they see an improvement in. So maybe, I, I don't know, digestion. I'll go with that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, so they want something different in their digestion. And so then that happens. But then what's the long-term impact? How do you reintroduce all those foods? And what then could be the impact on their digestive tract then (laughs) um, as they're reintroducing? And that's always been the case uh, historically with detoxes and really highly restrictive diets, very low calorie diets. When somebody is then reintroducing foods, that's that's the biggest time where there's a concern. So that's where the biological impact, it could feel a certain way or have some sort of positive impact. But then what's the long term impact? ramifications of it. And I know we have certainly seen clients that have done detoxes and cleanses and they just like can't get themselves off of it. And they're trying like (coughs) mentally and psychologically, they actually want to, but as they try, their body is rejecting it or, and they just gotten themselves into this spiral that's really hard Mm -hmm. to get out of. So, and what is happening at that point when, when their body might be rejecting something? Well, it's, it's a mix of chemicals, right? I mean, yeah. it's like what what bacteria isn't left there because they didn't have the grains in there to produce those ma- natural bacteria their body was used to and mm-hmm. um, the enzymes that their body's used to having. Like they're, 
it's a very huge disruption. Yeah, you sort of stripped your body of some of the tools There's that it normally lot, has. Yeah, I mean, a traditional detox definitely does that. Mm-hmm. And then you're kind of saying, well, then I'm going to just put all the new good stuff in there. But it's going, okay, well, what was so bad? Was it all bad? Was it really, do we need mm-hmm. to start so much from square one? So then, Julie, if somebody was trying to look at their nutrition to maybe make changes uh, with energy level or with digestion, and they were curious about that, how would yeah. they go about doing that rather than following a whole 30 or a detox or a cleanse. Yeah. I think you do it carefully and I think you do it slowly. I mean, it actually is similar to when I think of introducing new foods to kids or something. You do it with familiar foods and unfamiliar foods. You mix the new things and the changes, but something like this is so drastic, right? So I I just think that small changes are going to be the ways that we can gently make adjustments in and note well, that, I think that was maybe something that really did feel like it made an impact if I had less dairy, you know, but a lot of times it's a threshold um, versus a zero amount. So like people can have, maybe dairy can impact them, but maybe they have a little less dairy and it's actually just fine. But if they have all the amount, that's when they see the the reactions. But if they zero it out because, oh, they have some reactions, I don't think they need to eliminate it all, all the time, right? So slow changes and see if those kinds of things can And the part that's always been hard for me to understand is the attribution piece. Like what if it's misattributed? Right. And then I also think of placebo effect. It's just the psychosomatic piece, like what we think will happen can happen because of the power of our mind. (laughs) I don't know that. I don't know how you you would you basically would never have full certainty, I wouldn't think, around what is contributing to what. But I guess there's a lot of things in life we don't have full certainty around. Even back to the original question you brought to me, Carter, is like, mm-hmm. well, why is it so complicated? I still think that people are desiring to know how to eat right. and like somehow decide if they are feeding themselves in the way that they should, quote unquote, or like are taking into all the account of modern science and their own body and like, I don't know, all those things. And I, uh, I, I just do think that when we're assessing the what of a relationship with food, that's the wrong question. And I do just wish that there was a lot more address, you know, ways to address the how of eating and more emphasis on that. Like, I just wish there was more. And I think of some of Ellen Satter's work. So Ellen Satter is a dietitian and a social worker, and she has done research for decades and decades. And uh, mostly her results have gone into more of the family feeding arena, into public health, and into ways dietitians have then taught families and moms and dads to be able to feed kids. Uh, More currently, she created the eating competence model. And in that, she's trying to sort of quantify or give some sort of terms to sort of how do we know if somebody has a, a natural normal with quotes I don't know just like relationship with food that doesn't seem to be an issue and so she has created that model and that's something they use in her research um, when they're sort of assessing different pools of applicants you know in these studies and I just think that she has she's onto something in that and I, I guess I would love to just share those four yeah, things because I would love for even our listeners to like consider like wait is this instead of what am I eating <laughs> How? How am I approaching my relationship with food and how I'm eating? And can I consider these things as gauges to if I want to work on my relationship with food or maybe it's great? (laughs) It's good enough. Yeah. Yeah. So the first is eating attitudes. So how do I feel okay when I'm eating? And do I feel okay eating foods that I like? So especially thinking about pleasure and having comfort with the enjoyment of eating. And then the second one is food acceptance skills. And that envision thinking about having new foods. Am I able to try new foods, experiment with things, and actually learn to like new things? Think about that as maybe when you think of a child learning, getting new foods at the plate, you know, as a toddler. But more so taking that to the adult, like, okay, wait, can I be introduced something new and can I actually allow myself to try it and experiment with it and, and tolerate it and maybe even incorporate it regularly? And then the third one is internal regulation skills. And that's something that I think we, you know, intuitive eating and attunement work is something that we talk about maybe more, more often here. But um, can I eat as much as I'm hungry for? Am I hungry for something? Can I ask myself that question? Am I hungry for this? And can I, am I comfortable eating enough and feeding myself towards that point of fullness? 
And then the fourth one is contextual skills. And this is, can I take the time to eat and and do the adult responsible actions like grocery shopping and prepping some food or having the food that's easy to take and eat, but making the time to eat and paying attention to just general basic principles around food and nutrition and to make sure that you, you eat. Mm-hmm. So those are the four things that I think are more of like, am I, what am I doing in those zones? <laughs> I'm thinking of um, this idea of making time to eat. Maybe that was just because it was the last one you mentioned, but my mind stuck there. Yeah, Just because there is, I think, a good bit of kind of pushback in the culture around not eating in a way that is intentional anymore. And sometimes that turns into some of the diets again (laughs) of, you know, you shouldn't be having fast food or you shouldn't be doing this or you need Mm -hmm. to be intentional and lots of home cooking and all this stuff. Yeah, I'm just intrigued by this as actually still being incredibly important to have the context and the space to be able to think intentionally about your food, but also Mm -hmm. to pair that again with the pleasure piece feels really important. Mm -hmm. The pleasure of what do I actually want? Want. Am I able to Mm -hmm. be thinking through the things that I need and if it's enough and if it, if it satisfies the kind of body, mind and spirit? Yeah. I think that the diet mentality, when somebody has a plan that they're following, there's a lot more the question of, do I do I need that? Like, is this have a function? Is this a part of my plan versus do I want this? Mm-hmm. And that's more of that self-trust and more connectedness piece is like, do I want that? You know, and that's. Well, and outside of eating disorders, and I imagine listeners relate to this, that last one, what's the last one called? Contextual. Contextual is just the, that's also it reminds me of people that just are frustrated that they have to take the time just because time is such a commodity right now especially in our culture so even spending the time to do those things Mm -hmm. there can be frustration with having to be an eater as a person (laughs) spending their time that way yeah Yeah. Yeah. reminds me of Soylent yeah I was thinking of that too yeah in the tech world it's like a a nutritional supplement so you don't have to stop working you just can have your yeah and it's like your two meals in a bottle or a whole meal in a bottle or something like calorically very high so you don't even have to worry about it it's just like has everything Mm -hmm. you need Okay. Very little flavor. Talk about lack of pleasure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Just utilitarian. Get the job yes. done. Yeah. Work is the pleasure. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am thoughtful, though, around um, like people that maybe don't have constant access to food. This mm-hmm. feels like a, a mm-hmm. kind of a hard thing to say. You get, mm-hmm. to, you get to pick whatever you want, or you should. You should be mm-hmm. able to be concerned with your pleasure. You should be able to have enough. You should be able to have the time in your day to, yeah. to really spend cooking Mm-hmm. or thinking about your food mm-hmm. instead of thinking about work for those that maybe don't have that time. Yeah, the, that is a reality. I do think that there is a different experience. That's that's why the how of eating versus the what of eating really can cross socioeconomic status and, mm-hmm. and situations and cultures and ethnicities in my mind because one of the things that also Ellen Satter brings is uh, she has this food hierarchy. Oh, yeah. And it really speaks to that because it starts at the base. It's parallel to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it starts with the base of it going enough food. And somebody who is in a place where they don't have access to a wide variety of foods, it still is that's going to be the most important thing is to find the places where they can get the food. And at that point, yes, there isn't going to be as much of the awareness to pleasure, maybe the things that they would say are more familiar, maybe the things they would really prefer. That's biologically, they're just going to be going for what is enough. And then there is sort of a process to be able, yes, to be able to access the foods that they can and then move through some of these eating competent skills to be able to also go, okay, now I'm at a place where I can I can enjoy different things. Mm-hmm. The thing that the, the reality of at the bottom of the enough food is that there is a place where people are going to find food or get fed. And when we have judgments about the what that people have based on that they're choosing this based on the fact that this is what I can afford is this. And then if public health campaigns or something like that says, well, that's not good. You can't eat that food. You should be eating this other thing over here. That's the wrong target because they're just trying to feed themselves. And Ellen Sider does a beautiful job of saying, no, that is the, we can't be educating them about the what of food. Mm -mm. We need to be helping them understand the resources out there to be able to get them to have the amount Mm -hmm. of food that's going to biologically settle their, you know, physiology and all that stuff to be fed. Mm -hmm. From there, then they're going to start to think about what is the food that I actually would want to Mm -hmm. enjoy 
But I do think that there can be competent eaters in wide variety of contexts. And that's one of the things that I react to to some of the mainstream public health campaigns because I don't think that they communicate that you can have competent eating when you're having a lot of processed foods or, I don't know, not home time to cook. I'm like, right. I, I, I don't think it's about the what. Though. Would you, like yeah, I guess what would you say in response to the my plate and the, What's my plate? The, the, from government. the government issued, I think Michelle Obama was the one that kind of got oh, that. <laughs> okay. We're more familiar with it with our kids in public school, yeah. right? Public school, yeah. they're bringing in that nutrition as, as the curriculum. Yeah. I, I just think that the, that is still the emphasizing what. too much of the what. Yeah. And it's giving – It's I don't think that it allows for all of the nuances of even what you're speaking – you know, we're speaking to of the socioeconomic or the ethnic differences, cultural differences. Um, I also just – think that in the context of teaching kids about nutrition, if there was an emphasis on some of these other eating competence pieces, right, internal regulation, food acceptance skills, eating attitudes, letting them have a idea that ha enjoyment and pleasure with food is actually an okay thing. Like, I just think that's a better use of time, um, especially internal regulation skills. I just wish that, that that's not even part of the curriculum in terms of food and nutrition education to kids. And that, I think, is the main basis is like, let's have them understand and listen to their bodies versus them learn a plate that then might not at all correlate to what they're getting served at home or at the school lunch or whatever. So, yeah. I don't know if it's okay to go back to something related to the dieting. I, I do know that people that get drawn to doing dieting, even though I know I, maybe I said this, but I think they are really desiring some of the eating competence. And I actually think that some of these things actually do get they, they actually do happen for people that do maybe something mm -hmm. like the Whole30 or some other diet. And I don't want to I don't want to deny that or throw that out or have our listener think I'm not connected to that. Like I think of an example. So if food acceptance skills is one of the things. So can I experiment with new foods and learn to like them? I hear that a lot from people who do right. something like a Whole30. It's like I would have never used sweet potatoes in the way that I did, you know, that's great. But I, I wonder if, again, it's like misattributed, misattributed. Like I go, yeah, that is probably because it's feeding into your building of your own competence as an eater that you can take some new ingredients and know what to do with it and be creative with it. What if that's what it's fueling that that's making you feel good about it versus that you're having this experience with sweet potatoes fueling your endocrine system differently than rice. You know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, that's where I just wonder if we had more connection to how some of these things build our competence that we would actually be able to feel like, yeah. oh yeah, I'm a good competent eater. Yeah, I, I agree because a lot of people wind up choosing to go on a diet or changing something in their food intake. I, I wanted to say lifestyle, but mm -hmm. that's sort of the seduction of these yeah, diets yeah. is that it's a lifestyle change. Definitely. Or, you know, even in their exercise relationship to exercise, that they want to change something because they want to take some sort of control or some sort of power or, or feel some sort of agency in their life, which yeah. might be something that's incredibly needed for them. And it mm -hmm. is a time where they're feeling like, oh, I want to change this thing or I really want to like kind of be more in touch with myself and my life and I'm going to do it in this way. And you kind of – most of the time it, it, it can seem like all those eggs are put in one basket, the – I'm going to eat this way basket rather than I want to have more agency in my relationships and I really want to try this new thing and I want to be at home more and learn mm -hmm. how to cook and be creative in that way. It does go into the, oh, I, I succeeded and I have more agency now because I ate this way for 30 days or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's it does wind up being so self-esteem building and I can understand why people would really mm -hmm. enjoy that. But then but, there's the limiting byproduct because then you're right. – cutting out a whole bunch of things versus right. these eating competencies is so much more expansive because right. you're not having to cut anything out to do it mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. or making anything more narrow. But you still wind up like getting more experiences or just a different experience of yourself. I think that's what people want a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And it can go a little haywire or very haywire. Yeah, that is so true. When some, I think that I just, that rings true of what I, both for myself and what I've heard from clients about kind of the beginnings of their eating disorder. Mm -hmm. Just like the beginning of feeling just so good and so in control and so on top of it. Mm -hmm. And then more and more and more. And finally, then you started feeling trapped. Right. Right. Yeah. And in jail. I know. From all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. And we in the eating disorder world are fearful of that. Like I see diet as sort of this entry into <laughs> disordered eating and an eating disorder, right? One in three chronic dieters will develop an eating disorder. That's what research shows. So 
I go, okay, what is a chronic dieter? How often is that? If somebody's doing something like a current trend once every year, once every couple years, like what, what is that? I, I don't, I don't know what the definition is, honestly, but I just think somebody who's repeatedly doing that, I, I do fear that there is concern in that. And I know that we're maybe as those of us in the room are like, especially have our antennas up around that stuff. Like what would keep some people from the ability psychologically maybe to not go down that track, right? And like have to do it the better the next time versus just do it, eh, check that box a little bit and move yeah. on and it's done. Like some people can do that. And yeah. I, I, I watch it and I think it's impacting a lot of things, but right. you know, yes, it's not an eating disorder, but I still have concern about how it's impacting things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, I, I had probably all of the risk factors for an eating disorder. You know, I'm always stumped about why I, you know, how, why did it not mm -hmm. happen to me? So why, what is it about me that would allow for me to move away from mm -hmm. what I was really struggling with? And I, you know, who gets an eating disorder and who doesn't? It's just, I just can't, I'm surprised that I'm where I'm at didn't develop, mm -hmm. even though I have a more overcontrolled temperament and all of the variables you would yeah. typically say you're likely to have an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're thinking about like people needing to go through this whole hierarchy of food needs and we've talked before about how maybe not everybody knows what those all those steps are and then they're picking a diet to do something that's more instrumental mm -hmm. when maybe they're not getting enough food or, or whatever. But but some people I don't think would ever notice there was a problem with that or maybe they never would experience that as being a problem and definitely could have impact on the people around them. I would say that that's the most obvious problem that could happen beyond what they might be experiencing themselves. But I find myself, I think, really wanting to emphasize that for many of those people that aren't deeply impacted or go down some rabbit hole with a diet, there's just other stuff to think about. There's just other stuff to spend your time on, too. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's not the thing that fills the gaping hole, I do think that people get really distracted by fixating on their bodies or what they're eating and how to change their life in a particular way. And it's all about how you look. It's all about, am I eating enough? Am I healthy enough? Am I exercising enough? Et cetera. And not about, you know, how do my relationships look? And, you know, what else did I want in my life other than flat abs, flat stomach, whatever, you know, <laughs> just what, <laughs> what else do I want? And it's often a lot riskier to focus on those things and not get them than it is to change your diet frequently right. and feel some of the success or at least some of the focus of that and then get the external affirmation if you do wind up losing weight or something like that and mm -hmm. you're just it's not as fulfilling but it's also not as risky as some of the big the big things mm -hmm. that your heart would want mm -hmm. instead or if you don't yeah. even know what your heart would exactly. want. I mean, I think that's yeah. a lot of a pretty common experience of such a good point. I wouldn't even know what I'd be. I remember getting out of my in the transition in my recovery process. I remember thinking, I don't know what I like. I mean, there's just mm -hmm. so many big unknowns. So it wasn't like my what I was doing was blocking all these lovely future goals. Right. I didn't even right. know what yeah, I wanted. Yeah, weren't, there weren't any. There yeah. weren't any. It was blank. No yeah. one wants to feel blank. Mm -mm. Yeah. Have the identity rug pulled out from underneath them is scary. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting because as you're talking about it, I'm thinking about that the intrapersonal work, yeah. right? And that's the same, you know, I'm, I'm a room of therapists right now as the dietitian. So <laughs> um, always, right? It's always coming back like, wait, wait, there is work to be done on our full selves and who we are and develop that and understand that. And that's not marketed with a $40 billion industry um, <laughs> to, to grow emotionally and deeply, right? There's the, well, eliminate these six things and then here you are, right? And it's such an easy way to tangibly yeah. assess it. Self-inquiry? Yeah. Or a diet. Yeah. I mean, it just, yeah. yeah. Where do you go? Well, you just read this book and do it. And, yeah. you know, the self-inquiry thing, that's a lifelong process. Yeah. So, and the other, um, when I when I think of another piece of Ellen Satter's work that I would actually bring into this is this, is that there, the structure that she has given to parents in the feeding relationship with kids is actually something I love having be a, a kind of reused mm -hmm. when adults are trying to relearn their relationship with food. So, the division of responsibility that she has written for parents in their feeding relationship with kids is that the parents are in charge of the what, the when, and the where, and then the kids are in charge of whether or not they'll eat it mm -hmm. or how much they're going to eat. So the parents have a lot of the structure and um, regularity, the responsibility. They're having to put a lot of the effort into it, right? Like that last, the contextual skills, like making time to eat. The parents are having to do a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And then the kids get to come in 
and decide on that. Okay, am I hungry for that? Does that look good to me? Do I want it? I don't want it right now. I'll eat later, you know. And I love the parallel of thinking as we as adults maybe come out of diet, chronic dieting, or maybe just out of the diet mentality and never even knowing that, you know, or an eating disorder. I love the parallel of going, okay, what intrapersonally could I apply that to? So, okay, so I am going to do the what, the when, and the where for myself. I am going to take care of those things. I'm going to stock my fridge. I'm going to shop. <laughs> I'm going to have a table that has a, you know, actually dishes and silverware to eat with and think about the what, when, and where. Have some scheduling and make my life sane so I can actually stop to eat. And then when I get there, then I get to decide how much or whether or not I'm going to eat. But I'm going to do this work for myself to mm -hmm. set myself up to be able to eat. And I, I just, yeah, I think there's something in paralleling that as a way to take a step towards, uh, you said the word control. Like a lot of people turn to dieting for control. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to think about responsibility, <laughs> like, because we still have to do something with our food relationship. We, people want to control it, but what if we can just be responsible and take the actions to like prep ourselves to be able to feed mm. ourselves and, and engage in the moment? It's a beautiful thought. And I'm thinking psychologically how that translates the idea of control versus responsibility. I'm so curious about how people might have internalized those external voices we were talking about earlier, whether it's actually a voice about diet and what you're supposed to eat that's in our culture, or it's simply just the voice of your parent, mm -hmm. the voice of people that have maybe been the ones that are in charge of you in whatever way. Um, we internalize those things and think we're supposed to have control over ourselves. Or there's maybe a different way to think about how some of those relationships could have gone and they could be in a place of more like loving attention and attunement and care and mutuality maybe even in moments. And so if we are used to psychologically kind of having that voice in our head of needing to be controlled and we've taken that on, it's yet another space for us to do some work to think, actually, you know, there's been some psychological impact of maybe those external voices, even in my relationship with food. And how do I go back to a place of thinking I could mother myself differently in this and and show up and give myself the space, the structure, the kindness of some leadership in my own life mm -hmm. um, like a parent would have or could have and then feel taken care of mm -hmm. by myself because mm -hmm. I have groceries in the fridge mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. um, I have the things that I want yeah. and some time to eat it mm -hmm. it's such a helpful thing yeah. mm -hmm. thanks so much for joining us for this episode of the appetite to more easily access our next episodes, make sure to subscribe via your podcast app. To learn more about Opal Food and Body Wisdom, check out our website at opalfoodandbody.com or keep up with Opal on Facebook or Twitter. If you ever have any questions or just want to reach out to us at The Appetite, email us at theappetite at opalfoodandbody.com. Thank you to Aaron Davidson for The Appetite's signature music, to Jack Straw Cultural Center for Sound Engineering, and to Sarah Taylor for production assistance and editing. And thank you for listening. Bye, and talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.